to Flora and Friends, your botanical cup of tea, a podcast for plant lovers of any kind. We welcome guests to our botanical tea break to explore the history, science and meaning of plants for our lives. My name is Judith lundberg felten I'm a plant scientist, university researcher and founder of Flora L Design and I'm the hostess of your botanical cup of tea. Hello to all wonderful people out there tuning in today with me again for the Flora and Friends podcast. I'm delighted to have another guest in my podcast interview today and this is Julia Carlson who is a dear friend of mine and she is also a project leader for a project that is called Life Tiger. Life Tiger is a EU project um, that has been conducted between 2015 and 2020 among 14 different county administrative boards in Sweden and they are working together on controlled forest burning for management purposes. And Julia herself earned her PhD in forest planning at the Swedish University of Agricultural Science in 2017. And then she joined afterwards the county administrative board as a project leader. She's working in, in Westeros in the south of Sweden, middle of Sweden. Depends where you come from, how you see it, maybe. And yeah, I am delighted to have learned a lot about forest burning that there is positive ways of using fire in the forest, how this is done. It's quite a, a project to, to do this and to conduct this in a safe way. And Julia has shared a lot of insights with us, not just from Sweden, but also what controlled forest burning in other parts of the world is used for. So with that, I say welcome to Julia and enjoy this interview. <music> So welcome to the podcast, Julia. Thanks for having me. This is a very great opportunity to learn a lot about controlled forest burning. And maybe we start by you telling us what that is about. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so what we call controlled burning is actually uh, nature conservation burning uh, or that we use fire as a management method to to restore uh, the nature and specific structures in the forest. So is this used in a particular area of the forest, in particular forest days? Maybe we should go back one step and just tell the listeners what type of forests there are. Forests are things with trees, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there may be nature reserves and yeah. there's production forests. Mm -hmm. Do we have other types of forest in Sweden? Um, well, I would say that that there are different kinds of of species composition and uh, and different uh, structures of the forests, but but the main categories are, as you say. Uh, production forest which you you use for timber production uh, and also the nature conserves which you have set aside to to not use for for production but for keeping the the nature values in those forests and all the organisms that live there but then there are also forest land that or or trees that grow on land that is not as productive for instance, mires or very uh, rocky uh, grounds. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so these are what we call impediments um, too. Yeah. And in, in which of these areas do you um, do b this type of burning as a management practice? Um, is this in all types of forests? Yeah, well, it is uh, like... Here in in the it's like the northern uh, hemisphere of the globe. Um, there we have this kind of boreal forest, which are the the pines and the spruce forests that we are used to here in in Sweden. 
So for the control burning, we are specifically working in a nature type or a habitat that is called the Western Taiga, which is part of this boreal forest. And this is uh, mainly consisting of uh, pine forest. So if you imagine those open uh, forests with a lot of light coming in and those old pine stems, um, you might see lingon berries. <laughs> uh, so those very open pine forests, they have, they look like that because there is a disturbance of fire once in a while. And what otherwise happens in, in this natural succession is that the spruce grows under the, the, both the pine trees and also different broadleaves such as aspen and sallow and rowan. Um, they, they all, both those broadleaves and the pine trees, they want a lot of light and they grow quickly uh, when they are young saplings. But the spruces, they prefer to grow in shade. So they grow under the pine trees uh, and the broadleaves, and then they take over and uh, dominate. And if you want to keep the spruces away, you need to to actually do it <laughs> to 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 keep uh, those pine forests open. Uh, so that's one thing that we want to to have the the spruces. Uh, they they can live somewhere else. <laughs> um, uh, and 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 the reason also is because pine trees are developed to to uh, stand or tolerate fire. Uh, they have different strategies to overcome, but spruces don't. They have the shallow roots and the thin bark, and they don't create the resin. Uh, so so they don't survive of fires. But pines can really do that. Um, yeah, but then I would say that in this western taiga where we where we conduct the control burning, uh, we also do it to favor a lot of different species and organisms that have specialized on the environment that is created by fire uh, in those pine forests. Interesting. So fires fires are you generally something that is naturally occurring and maybe mm. we should go into that for a little while and say it's like what's actually the role of fire for a forest? It's a, it's a natural disturbance that happens once in a while, but what does it lead to? What benefits? Yeah, are exactly. Uh, so if we look uh, centuries back in time in history, there are those natural uh, causes of fire, such as lightning, for instance. Um, and that's a very natural phenomena. And the, then there have been, like, during evolution, a lot of, of species that have specialized on on the type of forest that, that is created uh, after fire. And that could be already when there is amber, and uh, it's it's still very warm and heat in in the soil, um, and also from the smoke, where some insects, for instance, they can feel the smell of the smoke on very long distances, and and somehow they have decided that they are they have a, have this dance in the smoke uh, to to find their partner and to mate. Um, Whereas other uh, species, such as plants, they have they have used their strategy to to reproduce themselves uh, as having their seeds in the soil, quite deep down in the mineral soil, and there there they can just be in this dormant stage, <laughs> resting until they feel that the fire is coming and there is a very high temperature like 40 or 50 degrees Celsius in the soil, and then they start to germinate, um, which is very fascina fascinating. Um, and then they flower one or two summers after that, and uh, 
yeah, spread their <laughs> their seeds once again. Um, so, and then we have another very important uh, like objective with the fire, and that is that it creates a very varied uh, structure in the forest. So we have uh, both standing old trees and we have all the, the new little saplings from, from different broad leaves, for instance, um, and different flowers that comes, but also um, that we have more dead wood, both standing and lying dead wood, and dead wood that is decaying in different stages. And that is truly uh, contributing to a rich diversity in species. Um, because there are all these thousands of species that have specialized very specifically on a certain kind of, of degree of wood decay where they put their larvae or... Um, and then there are all those uh, indirect effects of that, for instance, if there are a lot of dead wood where the the bugs or the beetles uh, can live, um, then it's uh, well a positive thing for for the woodpeckers because then they will have their food. Uh, so so and that's the whole thing with the ecosystem and the nature that it is all those different levels of species that are dependent on each other, um, mm. and the more diversity and variation. Uh, the more healthy and rich uh, the ecosystem are. Mm -hmm. So if you compare this type of um, management fires and the controlled burning to a forest fire as we see it in the news and like where large parts of the forest are burning, mm -hmm. like that seems more detrimental as an effect because there I guess you don't have anything that is left or is that also affecting the biodiversity in any positive way it's like can we among all this detrimental force that we see in large forest fires see any kind of benefit mm. um, well in those wildfires uh, some of those uh, very specialized species uh, are happy <laughs> of course um, uh, those uh, beetles for instance or flies that that use the the smoke um, and and because of a lot of dead wood is created, of course. Um, and there's also this uh, benefit of having more open sand that is not overgrown by lichens or shrubs or mosses. Uh, because a lot of uh, bees, for instance, uh, want to have uh, the open sand, um, which then it's, it's a very warm microclimate. Uh, which they like and um, so there are of course benefits also from a wildfire uh, for for certain species but it also depends a little bit on what kind of forest that is uh, burning um, and how severe uh, because if if all everything uh, just dies <laughs> Um, if it's if it's a very hard, severe fire, um, then we don't have that dynamic afterwards with different ages of the the living trees and um, yeah, it's more of a mausoleum. <laughs> mm. um, so, so when you when you do these controlled fires, how do you proceed? I guess you need to first pick the place where you're go going to do this. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you then doing an inventory or how do you pick that place and how is the whole fire started and maintained to not take over? Mm -hmm. um, so we do um, those uh, controlled burnings um, in the, the Nash, like the county administrative board in Sweden and like in every county there's uh, 21 of them but not all of them have this kind of Western Taiga pine forests uh, in the very southern part of Sweden, for instance. Uh, but but we conduct those burnings in nature reserves, uh, and then we, as a difference 
to, to the wildfires that can occur anywhere, uh, we target very specifically what kind of forest we will burn because we want to have the most optimal effect. Um, or we, we want to benefit as many values as possible. Either we, we try to, to create uh, a better structure in the forest, if it has been, um, in, in some cases there, there can be like young production forests that have been included in a nature reserve when that was established. And then in order to, to give a boost for the development of the, the biodiversity, uh, we could put that on fire or we could uh, often we use to to conduct the forest the burnings in in forests where uh, we have those uh, pines very old pine trees and that the spruces are coming and and taking over uh, and in order to to uh, well to help the nature uh, to keep the the pine forest values then we we put a fire on that as well. Um, so it's a lot about creating a, a diversity in, in the structure in the forest so that it's a big variation um, and that that we sort of pretend that there has been a lightning. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, because those effects they will last for 30 or even up to 100 years and there will be developments during several decades afterwards. So so instead of going in to the forest with mechanical measures like with a chainsaw and trying to create those kind of structures and dead wood, um, you, you, can, you can make one fire and then... Uh, have the same effect though for a very long time you don't need to go back there in 10 years and take away another yeah set of (laughs) spruce trees Mm -hmm. Um, but to ask uh, or to answer your question on um, on how we do it um, um, so that's also something that's very different from how a wildfire starts Um, so we have those areas uh, that we think are suitable for burning and then we also look at the surroundings are there roads that we can use as borders and are there different water courses that we can uh, use to have extra water to to um, well sort of uh, have control over the fire we we prepare this extremely carefully so we, we decide what borders we want to have around this forest that we want to burn. And then we put a lot of water around uh, those borders, um, like for several days even. So it's really wet to, to sort of uh, not having the escapes of the fire in case there is a, a little wind uh, strength. <laughs> uh, because that's that happens sometimes that the fire escape and and really jump over, <laughs> uh, and so so we have all those watchmen around the area that that is keeping track of that, and we also have an helicopter standby which goes up uh, once in a while to check like okay is the fire under control, and before we decide on what actually actual day we will we will have the burn uh, we follow the weather forecast very carefully and we look at at the moisture in the ground and uh, uh, how how the wind temperature and also the wind direction and the intensity of the wind how that is correlating with each other and then we all always make a test fire to see if if we have found this day where there seem to be very safe and optimal conditions in the weather forecast we still try like make a trial every every time uh, and in case the wind direction has changed a little or if it's uh, if it's much warmer or drier in the air or if any of those values 
isn't optimal anymore, uh, then we cancel it. So we we never take those risks just because oh we put so much preparation work. Uh, but yeah, that's life mm -hmm. <laughs> in that case because we don't want to to take any risks regarding security. Mm. Uh, but then we also have a very specific method for how we we actually put the fire on, <laughs> and that's called ignition when you when you really torch uh, and and put fire on the vegetation. So we decide what in connection to the topography. Um, then we we make uh, lines where we we ignite. Uh, along this line um, and they can be in like 10 meters between every line or uh, yeah what distance that is appropriate uh, so then we we sort of use the wind so that the fire is is burning for a small little area uh, a little section uh, and and that the wind blows the fire so that it's driving towards this wet border that we have already prepared to be very wet so so that means that the fire is a very low intensity so it's mainly to burn off uh, the humus layer and the bushes perhaps and and to to put fire on the tr on the spruces but we don't want uh, the fire to to burn like high up along the stems or to to uh, be like in the tree crowns because then you lose control of it. Um, yeah, so and then when we have put the first line and that one has is done with, with burning, it's only the amber left, then we put the next line, perhaps five or ten meters for the next section, so to say. Okay, it's really burned section by section. Yeah. In small areas. How yeah. long does it burn for? It depends uh, because then we have those uh, watchmen <laughs> uh, that actually are there uh, day and night and sometimes up to weeks to check that the burn, like the amber, is not uh, having a, a renewal <laughs> or that the fire starts again because it's so warm in the soil. Uh, and it also depends on what weather forecast there is. Uh, if it's if, if it's a a big rain some days after, then then it really um, stops. Um, mm. Yeah, that's a very interesting procedure. I had never really thought about how that is done. It's it requires lots of planning and a yeah. lot of being in, in sync with nature to do mm. this in a safe way. Yeah, definitely. And we also um, either we have those uh, we have those hoses, uh, water hoses all around so that we can uh, well just water uh, even trees uh, and we water around spe special uh, objects that we want to protect for instance a very um, like a, a specific bird nest or or a very old uh, dead uh, pine tree that we want to keep um, so we try to to protect those um, and save them from from the fire but with water um, and sometimes we we also have um, uh, if there aren't like a little lake or or a stream nearby, then we drive water there in a big tank. Uh, so, mm. so it's a lot of, of precaution around it. Um, quite a, a big project. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. It's a, it's a lot of logistics around yeah. this. So you have also been uh, to other countries and you're collaborating with other countries about controlled forest burning. What have you experienced there and how is that different from how you're doing it here in Sweden? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we were at, on a study trip to the United States uh, where we visited both the uh, Grand Canyon uh, and uh, the more southeastern parts uh, uh, of Georgia and uh, Florida. And in in United States and also in Canada, 
and in the Mediterranean region here in, in southern Europe, in Portugal and Spain and, and Italy, uh, they suffer a lot from wildfires, uh, which we hear every summer uh, in, in very severe and dramatic ways, because there are huge fires that spread enormously fast. Uh, so they work with, with controlled burning in another way, uh, and they call it prescribed burning. Uh, there because the main reason or, or purpose is to uh, to burn away the the bush layers in the vegetation uh, both like the grasses and the bushes and the small low trees um, because the fire easily spread when um, uh, they have all this vegetation that they can use. Uh, so if you take that away, you sort of interrupt the fire or, or at least s slows it down. Um, so, so they were much more like focusing on how to prevent the bad fires with good ones. That was their slogan. They basically didn't talk so much about species and habitat structure and nature conservation. Uh, they were more focused on, on how to, to take away the bush layers. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also how you work a lot in southern Europe. Uh, whilst we don't have that kind of severe uh, fires every summer, um, so and we don't really have exactly the same vegetation types as in those very dry parts around the globe. Uh, they are closer to the equator, of course, mm. because it's further south. Um, so I think that's a difference uh, too, what kind of vegetation we have, even though they also have different uh, species of pine forests. Um, but yeah, they, they have another purpose with it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. What what do people? How do people react to uh, forest burning? I mean, people who have their forest and own their forests close by, or people who see it, do they understand the purpose? Do you get negative reactions? What what? Mm -hmm. How do you perceive that? Well, it's it varies. Uh, there are often um, a lot of questions, um, and people are worried. Uh, and sometimes they might be affected by the smoke, uh, which is something that everyone reacts to a lot. When you feel the smoke somewhere, you usually call the SOS alarm and, and uh, hey, it's, it's a fire somewhere. <laughs> so what we do is that we communicate a lot with the people that live nearby and uh, perhaps in the local newspapers and in the municipality that we will conduct a, a controlled burning in this area and we have we describe the different security measures that we have undertaken uh, and we also describe like for how long it it will continue and what the effects are and of course we tell them why we do it <laughs> and usually people um, are more um, willing to accept that when they understand why we do it and that it has such a benefit for for um, the nature values um, but there are also criticisms from from ornithologues or or um, bird watchers and other that are thinking about the the animals and and uh, springtime about all the the small uh, <laughs> animal kids is not the word. <laughs> but the small animals, because they can't, they can't yeah, run away maybe yeah, the same way no, as the adult ones. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but, but then we... Um, so at, because we do a lot of preparations in those forest areas, we already are there with our human uh, disturbance. Uh, so usually the animals stay away then if they can. And if there are bird nests, we try to protect them, to move them, or to, to be sure that we don't come with the fire close to it. And sometimes we actually just have to accept that nature has its own. Uh, I mean, would if there would have been a wildfire, they would have died, unfortunately. 
Um, so, so if you look at it from a bigger perspective, it's more beneficial to actually have all the nature values that are are uh, created by the fire than to save one little bird family. Um, uh, but we often have have different questions about those things. Mm -hmm. What about CO2 emission from these fires? Is that a problem that you have to deal with? Uh, we also receive a lot of questions about that. Um, so when we when we conduct the controlled burnings, we we don't have such a high intensity level on the fire that there are a lot of trees that die. Um, we we try to keep. I mean, of course, we want to create dead wood, uh, but we don't burn up all the wood. It's like it's not empty afterwards. Uh, uh, and and in our case, it's it's ra rather that all this, the pine spruce are still alive, hopefully. Um, so then we don't have that kind of carbon dioxide emission uh, as it's it's not stored in the uh, ground layer. Uh, that's not where the largest content of, of mm. carbon dioxide in the forest is. And that's the one that disappears. But yeah, there are research ongoing on those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, do you do you have any recommendations for information if people want to know more about controlled forest burning or nature conservation burning? Mm -hmm. um, where can they look back things? Are there books, are there resources online that you can recommend? Yeah, uh, so... In, in those uh, 14 uh, different counties in Sweden that have been part of this project that I've been working with, uh, one can go into the website of those uh, county administrative boards, uh, which is Länsstyrelse in Swedish. Um, so they have a lot of information on each of those authorities' websites. Uh, and where they also describe in what nature reserves in that county that there are fires or have been. And in several of them, there has also been, um, uh, we have made uh, information trails. So you can walk uh, in a forest that has been burned and there are information signs which which shows different species uh, that, that are uh, benefited from it and... Um, yeah, it's very nice. Uh, and then uh, we have a project website, of course. Uh, our project is called Life Taiga. Uh, so one can can look a little bit on our website. And there is also a very nice uh, short film. It's 25 minutes on YouTube, uh, which is called Lea van de Taiga. And there is a version with English uh, subtitles. And and it's really nice because then they they have been filming when we conduct the control burning. So you see the flames and you see the preparation before and after uh, and the inventory of, of insects. And there are different researchers that describe what, what they are doing and why. Uh, so that's something I recommend too. Mm, wonderful. That's a wonderful thing. I will definitely link to these pages. And also I like the idea to really go and experience one of these forests where it has been burning. And it's nice mm -hmm. that you made these trails that people really yeah. can get information and yeah. understand the purpose of this. And it's quite a beautiful forest too, because you see the fire scars in the tree stems and you see sort of the black uh, uh, coal Mm -hmm. uh, on the stems mm -hmm. uh, and you can also see much more of the stones um, and the geology from the soil because the lichens and mosses are away for a couple of years and it could be a really good source for lingonberries and mushrooms after a burning <laughs> so so it's a good tip too to to look up to to go there for the for a harvest the, exactly <laughs> the secret tip here in the end mm -hmm. uh, where do you think uh, we are heading with controlled forest burnings in the future. You have mentioned that in, in very dry areas where f wildfires become more intense and mm -hmm. problem, people start to do uh, preventive burning. Mm -hmm. Are there other areas where you would think the development is going to change 
in the type of burning we are doing here in Sweden or mm. in other areas in the world? Um, well, I think this um, this type of forest that is benefited from fire, uh, it, it could be any any kind, of course, because there have been lightnings all over the globe. Uh, but from my perspective, we are using it more as a management mes- method to to foster the conservation values and nature restoration uh, here in the boreal part of the forest. And and that's quite important to continue to do that because we, we lose a lot of, of uh, um, pristine forests uh, as a lot of forest in Sweden, for instance, is production forest nowadays. So in order to, to um, create environments for all those red list uh, species that are threatened uh, and don't well they are about to being extinct then we really need to help them uh, finding their habitat for for a living um, so so we, we have this national goal from from the environmental protection agency to conduct a certain amount of control burning every year and we are not even close to the the level that would be needed actually um so we just keep on <laughs> working with this um yeah yeah wonderful so if we have young listeners that like to play with fire there may be the future career ahead <laughs> where they can play with fire in controlled ways and benefit yeah, <laughs> benefit yeah diversity. why not mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time and all these uh, very interesting insights about how uh, fire can help the forest for more diversity and uh, species richness and can be a great means to, to foster life in the forest. Thank you, Judith. I hope you have enjoyed this episode and I think thank you for tuning in here today. All the resources that Julia has mentioned are found in the show notes to this podcast or on our blog at www.flora-l.com forward slash blog. In the blog article, I've also linked to the YouTube video if you want to know more about the Live Tiger project and see it with your own eyes, as well as to the resources where you can read more about Live Tiger and where you can find forest trails here in Sweden where controlled forest burning has been conducted and you can see the results of it. I will be back here in two weeks with a new episode about how fungi are important for our forest and we are going to dig together into the soil and discover the hidden life of the forest. And until then, I wish you a wonderful time, a good week, a good day, a good evening, wherever you are. And thank you for tuning in with me today. 